It's my pleasure to, to introduce Graham uh, for his talk. And just as a means of a, a bit of uh, a brief background to, to uh, Graham's journey, because many of you are obviously aware that he's chairman, but not, not his journey to this point. So in the earliest days and, and after a brief interlude teaching maths and electronics at TAFE, and uh, he did a 18 year stint with Telstra, uh, and, I, and later joined a small German company, Siemens. Not so small, I would, uh, I would say, but he fooled around with telephony, broadband and GSM networks for a few years. His interest in wave analysis and software mod modeling of the same then got the better of him, and he set up a few companies uh, with the intent of uh, exploiting this. Uh, automotive internal combustion engine design, loudspeakers and lights were all assaulted. Uh, mainly resulting in Graham finding the difference between technical and commercial accolades. Uh, most recently, his work uh, has strayed into audio capture and reproduction formats, uh, human perception, diffractive sounds and optics, and even tone scale analysis, all the while considering uh, uh, from, from the wave perspective. So tonight, Graham will summarise his work, uh, which commenced in... 1995, dealing with guided wave analysis, and uh, it will show us where this this with this leads. Um, he's assured me that there's uh, minimum mathematics and uh, that you can ignore it anyway, uh, but I find that hard belief. We'll we'll see how he goes. Thank you very much, Graham. Thanks, Evan. You've got to try and have no maths. So that'll be a challenge. Okay, but tonight I'll be talking about the acronym PAM, PAM, which stands for Parametric Acoustic Modelling. Nobody knows that that name was chosen from a list of about 20 names by Thomas and Holman in America to promote it, uh, particularly for the American market. It'll be looking at a structured approach to loudspeaker design and also guided media in general, and I'll talk a bit about what that all means. But first, one of the jobs that came up five years into this development of technology was that we were running a centenary celebration in Australia, in all states, and it was Mahler's Eighth Symphony. Mahler's Eighth Symphony is a rather grandiose piece, and it demands a full-scale church organ. But you couldn't fit the number of people we needed to fit into the venues in the available churches, so we had a problem. We designed a loudspeaker to do this. The specification for that loudspeaker was for it to be compact, and I'm about to show you what compact means. It had to have a response from 16 hertz to 17, 70 hertz, plus or minus 1 dB, and be able to produce 125 dB SPL at less than 2% audible distortion. That was a challenge. We met that challenge. We met it with Pam, our friend Pam. Pam was able to help us do that design work. So we now go through what that is. First up, it's always been waves. It's all about waves. It's about waves propagating. It's about waves coming from my voice instantly to all of you and you hear them. It's been going on for a very long time. 7000 BCE, we used that horn of a ram to produce sound. The claim was that it made a wall tumble down. I think what it did was herald the army arriving who made the wall tumble down. However, in those 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 years, we've made a lot of progress. That is New York in the year 2016, and I think you can see some similarities there. What's common about that is the waves. The waves have been the same for 7,000, 8,000, 9,000 years. <coughs> if we're going to make a loudspeaker, we need a motor. We need something that turns electrical signals into bigger signals. We've had a number of different motors. In 1851, Ries, German, made a magnetostriction device that changed its length when you put current through a wire around it. Miyuki made a moving iron. 
microphone and loudspeaker for his telephone that he did in 1856, 20 years before Bell. Um, Bell came along and he made what is a very early sort of rocking armature motor to turn electrical signals into sound. There's a bit of an anomaly here that Short Parsons in 1898 made a compressed air amplifier. This was an air modulated amplifier, not electrical. In those days we didn't have active devices to amplify. I can absolutely recommend you look at that website for that auxetophone. The device played an ordinary gramophone record, but it was too loud for domestic use. It was used for broadcast and other matters. 1898. Moving coil designs first appeared with von Siemens from Ernst Siemens in 1874. Tuned structure to make a loudspeaker. Lodge moved towards what we're used to now in England with some of his designs of loudspeakers and was using the horn. There it is again. There's that shofar horn again. Uh, and then Rice and Kellogg in America in 1924 came up with what you would now recognise as a standard loudspeaker. Looks a bit different there because it's got a coil of wire. They didn't have permanent magnets of suitable strength in those days. <coughs> then we need to add a box. We're making loudspeakers. We've got to put the speaker into a box. The first box, this is an English Atwater Kent box and it has holes at the front where the cone is and it sits into that frame and has holes at the back. So sound comes out the front and the back. You can see that's a very close um, model of loudspeaker to what was the original Rice Kellogg. Looks very similar. However, it wasn't necessarily new. If you looked at the old Egyptian frame drums, they were the same sort of thing, except they didn't have an electric motor, they had a hand motor. Then we moved on to the base reflex enclosure, vented box, some might call it, and we find that that was around about 300 BCE with the African drum, which had a, a tuned bottom. It didn't sit on the ground, you tilted it up when you were playing it, and it was a tuned resonance structure. And then we came up with a sealed box, and Acoustic Research were one of the first companies to do that, to, to get that sealed box designed to work, and that's very much like the membrana phone of 3000 BCE. What was happening here? We were starting with the real world, taking an educated guess that something would work, building one, and then going around the loop. We came up with rules of thumb. When we got onto electric motors, we said bigger magnets and bigger voice calls make better loudspeakers. But bigger magnets and bigger voice calls are more expensive and they're heavier and they give bad bass and light cones are louder but light cones distort. And good bass needs big boxes but big boxes cost money and boxes sound flappy. We also looked for materials. We went through quite a selection of materials. I've done them in alphabetical order there but we, we go through quite a lot of materials for magnets, cones, suspensions, baskets, all of those sorts of things. In amongst all of that, we do, we do, or we did, have a core belief that there must be that ultimate loudspeaker box, that really clever box that just does it, just makes it work so much better than all the others. There must be a magic enclosure design. Let's keep going till we find it. Then along came Neville Teal. Neville Teal, who'd been working in electrical filters for many, many years, said, well, it's a motor, it's a cone, it moves air, the air radiates waves. If I can determine the cone movement, I can determine the response. He'd done a lot of work on filters, and this is probably the only bit of maths here. Actually, it's not. I'm lying, aren't I? But he'd done a, quite a lot of work and said, well, for a resonant structure, a structure that goes preferably at one frequency, we have some mathematics that describes it. That's it there. So if I get my loudspeaker, it has mass, it has stiffness, and it has loss, and it'll prefer to wobble at one frequency. 
I now have a mathematical model so I don't have to keep building boxes. I can tune the mathematical model, make it agree with the real world, and then I've got a better, repeatable, more accurate result. We add a motor to a cone. Here we have a cone. A cone consists of a piece of paper, Kevlar, all those other things I mentioned. It has a spring associated with it and it loses energy, it has loss. We then add a motor to that. The motor is usually an electromagnetic motor, it doesn't have to be, and that takes charge of that mass and that stiffness, but it's not rigid, it's still got a little bit of give with it. So the end result of that is we get a complete structure that may prefer to go at one frequency, may not, may have a big peak somewhere because we didn't control it well enough, or may be very badly damped. What we need to do then is manage those parameters so we get the response we want. Do it mathematically. Do it with Neville's parameters, Neville and, and Richard's parameters. Seeking a sealed box on the enclosure means that you've separate out the front wave from the back wave. That's a good idea, they don't cancel. But it also means that you've added a whole lot of air on the cone and made the cone stiffer. And that air's got mass, and that air's got loss. So when you combine that air with the speaker, everything changed. But it was still a second order system. You'd, just, you'd added more mass, you'd added more stiffness, you'd added a bit of loss, but it was still the same equation. All you needed to do was to work out the coefficients and you'd have the response. Then you could play with them and get what you wanted. <coughs> yeah, I, I lied, didn't I? Um, here we see a second order response which rolls off at a certain rate and it's been specifically adjusted to behave itself. No peaks, no dips, nice response out to a corner frequency, then it rolls off. We could have peaked it, we could have rolled it off earlier, but we've done it for maximum bandwidth. We can change the structure of the box to be vented. What does that do? That adds a second resonant thing. It's not the cone that's resonating now, it's the air in the box that's resonating. We've got two resonant structures. My God, how do we manage that? Well, you do it with mathematics. <laughs> and you don't worry too much about the detail there. It means that if we choose the vent, the gas volume, the speaker stiffness, the speaker mass and the loss and get it all really nicely done, we end up with this response here. It looks like it's the same corner frequency but you'll find that the box design doesn't have to be as large or as small to do it. But you'll see now that the speaker is rolling off much more steeply. So as you go down in frequency, the sound is dropping quicker. Why would we do that? Well, there's a very, very good reason. This second resonance with the gas gives you a minimum of cone movement. Cone movement means distortion. Minimised cone movement means minimised distortion. So suddenly the vent has given us this big advantage Whereas previously the cone was going further and further and further, now it goes through a minimum. Beaut. Nothing in this world is free. Below that frequency, it takes off at a huge rate. And so what happens is if you send signals to the vented box below the frequency you designed it for, it will sound terrible. But down to that frequency, it'll sound better. We were talking about the magic box design. We wanted to find the magic box design. Here's a few examples that I've produced. Each one of those is following a quest for the ideal box. There's, the sad thing is that there is no magic box design. And there's a very important, although totally unrecognised paper published in AES in 1996, which proves that it doesn't matter what shape the box is, it's going to have a certain efficiency bandwidth. Very important paper. Very bad news for the box designers. 
and very bad news for chipboard sales call. All right, now we're going to talk about PAM. Neville got to a certain point, PAM comes along. What is it? Well, where I started with this was to say, if I have gas in a pipe and it comes to a hole in the end of the pipe, some of the energy will get reflected and some of the energy will get through. So we, we approach this restriction with a wave. Some of it's transmitted, some is reflected. And all we're then going to do is talk about what rules apply. What rules apply for the air, energy coming in, the energy going through, and the energy bouncing back. Trivial? Trivial. Except, unfortunately, if you put two of these structures in, the energy bounces back, then forward, then back, then forward, sets up a standing wave, sets up multiple standing waves. And every one of those has to be taken into account. In the frequency domain, you have the basic frequency, twice the frequency, three times, all the way to infinity. This is a spectrograph showing all of the harmonics in a single played piano note of G. A single piano note has harmonics going out to the 60th, going out five and a half octaves, and that's one note, one resonant structure. So once you start making complex resonant structures, you're going to have problems with managing all of these overtones. That's what PAM does. We've got rules for the energy splitting based on the impedance of the incoming wave and the discontinuity. We can have multiple reflections, transmissions, attenuation and so on. We can have splits and combines. As long as we get the rules right for each one of those, we can solve the whole thing for all frequencies, all harmonics, all energy, all tones, everything. How do you do that? Well, first off, you look at the gas and say, gas has a certain springiness and a certain mass. That means it has a certain, what we call, impedance. It also has a certain amount of loss. It gets rid of energy as the waves travel through it. We can model that, but we have to model it as a continuum. We can't just say one equation, one resonant frequency, that's it. Now the problem is we've got an infinite number of infinite resonances. So we need a new approach, and that approach is what I call distributed. You can imagine that if we put a whole series of pipes together, we'd come up with a mesh. We have a piece of pipe here, which could be a duct in a box, and a piece of pipe here, which could be a chamber at the back of the box, a piece of pipe here, and so on. You'll end up with constant sections between nodes. It's a mesh, it is a node analysis problem. What you have to do is solve for all frequencies, all time, all nodes. Simple. And it's simple because MIT made the SPICE solving engine, a circuit analysis tool that enabled you to solve for all the conditions at all the nodes for all time. Very useful tool. And me being one to exploit tools, quite happy to exploit that one. But that approach there with the gas, doing it as a, a series of connected points where the gas flows, can also apply in other areas. What about in the electrical domain? We could have resistors and capacitors and inductors, but they're in nodes, they're connected between nodes. We could use the same approach to analyse electrical circuits. If we did the mechanical domain, we've got a mechanical cone that wants to push air, we can use that as a motor. But that mechanical cone pushing the air will have its own mass, its own stiffness, its own loss. So we can start to put together different domains where similar rules might apply. In fact, that's what I did. I took the electrical, mechanical and acoustic domains 
and just basically bolted them together. Does that make sense? I've got some yeses and some noes and some what the hells. Okay, okay, good, thank you. The domain rules, we won't worry too much about it. In the electrical domain, we have a force, a pressure, a voltage. That force or pressure or voltage makes current flow. The flow variable is current, the through variable is current, the pressure variable, the node variable is voltage. Mechanical domain, a little bit different. Force and velocity still apply, but now you've got mass and stiffness. You haven't got voltage and current, you've got mass and stiffness. Mass, force, acceleration, we can work with that. All I then needed to do was to have transforms between the domains and I could take an electrical circuit, bolt it onto something, an electric motor, loudspeaker, bolt the signal into that, new domain, work it out, then bolt it into some ducts, work it out. The transforms turned out to be really simple. The, the electrical to mechanical was force equals the the magnetic field times the length of the coil times the current. F equals BLI. Simple. More mass though, sorry about that. And then for the mechanical to acoustic, it's even simpler. Pressure is force over area. So all I need to do is have that transform numerically and that transform and I can take the most complex electrical circuit, digital and analogue, and the most complex mechanical circuit with girders and springs and things, and the most complex interconnected network of tubes. Stick a signal in this end and find out what sound comes out that end. Interesting point, if you do your sums correctly, I know I'm over here but I'll shout. If I change the conditions here, you can reflect all of that back through these. Make them bi-directional so the effect on the current and voltage in the amplifier turns into a, a, a behaviour of a cone which turns into the velocity of air and the pressure of air. So I can, I can change things here and here and here and here and optimise things. <coughs> OK. <laughs> Do I get away with this? Here what we have is the electrical domain and over here we have the acoustic domain. All I'm now doing is looking in the electrical area and what I'm doing is making a current turn into a force on a mass with a stiffness and a loss. I know they're inductors and capacitors and resistors, but all the maths works out and they behave correctly. What did I say I needed to get from electrical to mechanical? I needed BLI. Remember I said the magnetic field times the current? All I need to do is put amplifiers in here with the gain equal to the BLI product. So there's one there and one up there. That's a fancy circuit called a gyrator that lets things change over here and affect back here and vice versa. But here I'm just coming with a current and voltage, sticking it through a gyrator and then I've got mass. What's happening at that node is not voltage or current. You've got to keep your mind thinking that is velocity. So now I can solve for the velocity of the cone. Then I transform it through this. This is just the area of the cone. 0 0.051 of a square metre. It happens to be a 12 inch cone, I think, is it? Is that a 12 or a 15? <laughs> probably a 12. Probably a 12. Um, and that transforms out to the velocity of the gas. Very, very powerful. Very powerful. And I'll show you some examples of this. I think at this point, <laughs> You can refer to the patents and things, but at this point accept that we can have electrical circuits influencing motors that influence gas and it all works.
I can relate it back to Neville's work when we used to do that, but I tend to use what I term natural parameters. So I use mass, stiffness and loss, whereas he uses compliance and whatever else he wants to use or what, what he wanted to use. But there, you can interchange them. A little bit about these transmission lines because when you're building one of these tomorrow, you'll need to know a little bit about this. Tube with a bit of gas. Here we're saying that that tube with a bit of gas in it has an impedance in one end. It's just a function of the area and the gas that's in it. And it has a length. And the length is the time, the propagation time. So I can now have impedances and lengths to make acoustic structures, tubes. We can express the volume in a box or in a tube or in whatever just as the area of the end and the length of it. So I can work out how much gas volume we've got. Here's an example, a tube, 250 millimetres in diameter. You probably haven't thought about this before, but it's a tube. It's 700 millimetres long. It's 250 millimetres diameter. Its characteristic impedance, when you work out the maths, is 8,420 ohms. It's not like your electrical days where you had 300 ohms and 70 ohms and all that. You come up with really good impedances. And it's got a time of propagation of 2.04 milliseconds. When you multiply that by that, you end up with a volume of 34 litres. I put it into another one. Same thing, much smaller tube, much higher impedance. Shorter time, shorter tube, <coughs> smaller volume. This is the first speaker we patented, which is a 20 hertz woofer. And what I've done there is tipped it upside down so you can see all the paths of the cascaded tubes, sections that the energy has to go through. Here is one of Mike's fine loudspeakers. Sound coming out of there, in the simplest approximation, travels to there and hits a boundary and bounces back, and travels to there and goes out through those two ports. That's what it looks like in the model. We have a chunk of gas going back to a wall, and a chunk of gas going forward to those two tubes. Then that goes into a bigger tube, or two bigger tubes, this bit and this bit. Then it goes into a common duct, if you like, going out. From there, it joins into that big chamber at the end. Now what you don't know is there are two tubes here that go back into the back of that box and the back of that box is one big chamber. So from here I need to go to the back of the cone and I'm a lousy artist so I just draw it again. This is, this is the rear of the speaker and I've got the same thing up in the back of the box. This is the front with all of those labyrinth sections. What I do now is put a signal into the terminal of the loudspeaker, solve that network and adjust the amplitudes and phases to give me the transfer function I want. Yes. Um, right. In here, just in there, is that chunk of circuit I showed you with the gyrators. All it does is it turns electrical signals into mechanical. Then, coming out of there, I go into these tubes. That, that, those funny looking symbols that look like bent back-to-back -back pipes are just Spice's equivalent circuit for a transmission line. So all I need to do is to draw that circuit in SPICE, put in the right values. Here's 
an impedance of 1,214. That's a big pipe. Here's an, in, an impedance of 32,000. It's a small pipe and so on. Coming out the end of that, we go through the rear vents, all of those front labyrinths, and they combine into the room. Then we have an air load. Don't worry about the air load. Another topic. Remember I said that it was the velocity of the cone, not the displacement? Well, in order to get the displacement, I need an integrator. So I'll put, it, I'll put that in. Now that is, it looks complex, but it's very solvable. You just plug those values in, press the go button, and what do you get? Well, this is what you get. You get the amplitude and phase from the input terminals of the amplifier to the air in the room at the listener. And you can see here, the model has come up with the theoretical black line for that, and the red line is what we measured. What is happening now is you're getting quite good agreement, especially for the low frequencies, but you can also see that you're getting agreement with some of these higher overtones. And it's just my very bad modelling that didn't make it better. But it meant now for the first time we could model the whole of the frequency response of a loudspeaker. And we could get it quite accurately with amplitude and phase. Further, if we change something, change the flux density in the speaker, change the equalisation in the amplifier, change the box shape, change the material in the box, change the tubes, change the room, it would all be allowed for. When you do it this way, did we put any absorptive material in that box? Didn't need it. It's all stub equalisation, lossless. We haven't wasted any energy. So therefore we're sitting on maximum efficiency, but we're tailoring the response. We don't have to soak it up with sponges. <laughs> this is the 616 organ speaker that I spoke about. This comprises four 15-inch loudspeakers. You can see their labyrinths going out to a summing area there. You really need a photograph of it. Um, and there is a photograph, but I didn't put it in here. The rear chamber then comes out through a vent. It's a 22-inch diameter vent, so it's a large vent. But the rear chamber comes out through that. And these front chambers sum to it in a similar way to that other box design that I showed you. Little trick in the back. This is reactive equalisation. It's not lossy. So what I did was I put stubs, acoustic stubs, just tubes, but chosen to have the right dimensions so they control the overtones in that vent. So we didn't get a reactive peak and dip and peak and dip. It controlled those so we got a flat transfer function. It was also extremely useful because it braced the back of the box. <laughs> okay, how did they work? There's a whole lot of reading there, but they, the, the guys in America were very nice to me. You can actually see one of those boxes. That is a 616 there. That's in a home cinema in Canada. That's a rather impressive home cinema. Uh, he owns the whole block. <laughs> he's got, next to that, he's got a tennis court and a squash court in the basement. Okay, so there's quite a lot of promotion there. Because we were sitting on maximum efficiency, we did have tailored amplitude and phase response and we did have low distortion. And that just doesn't make a fair comparison to other products. Does that give you? Okay, now we can have a little bit of a break here.
you've gone through all the heavy lifting, you've gone through all the maths, if you've got it in your head that you've got now got a closed form solution to turn electrical signals into sound, we now look at what we can use that for. The first thing is we can look at the load that the amplifier is seeing. What sort of currents and voltages does that amplifier have to provide? We can look at what happens if the amplifier clips. What happens to the whole system? What happens to the harmonic distortion? Where does the cone go? Where does the smoke come out? All those sorts of things. We can look at adding digital, analog, passive, whatever sort of crossovers you want. We can put them in. We can have protection devices. We developed a thing called Guardian, which was a protection device that acted to disconnect the speaker when it went outside its happiness. But there's more. We can do alignment for time of multiple loudspeakers so they don't cancel where we don't want them to. We can come up with some very interesting box designs, not because we're going to come up with a really clever, efficient box. They're all efficient. What we can do is come up with an interesting box design which has a good phase linearity or a good amplitude response or whatever you want to do. We don't need a motor. Now that we've got a tool that can analyse acoustics, we can make passive absorbers. We can just model the acoustic and mechanical part. And so, OK, we want an absorber to get rid of a base in this room. We'll just model that. And we worked with a company called MSR in America to come up with that spring trap corner design. That has 34 dB of absorption at 70 hertz, which is more than most people need. <laughs> Then we went into some cascaded designs. We had jobs for European and English car manufacturers. And what we were doing there was adding multiple sort of, how do you describe it, multiple cones on the one motor. Uh, we had coupled designs where we coupled the acoustic energy into the cabin. We solved the mass of the cabin so the acoustic energy was delivered to the driver. We could solve the problems where you put multiple drivers in a box and then wonder why it starts doing horrible things with cancellation. We could do cascaded elements, but we could design mufflers. Cascaded impedances, mufflers. We could design and analyse car structures because they're just guided waves going through steel structures. We could make new acoustic diffusers to transmit and diffuse energy. We could go into nonlinear media. Because we can step cascaded impedances, we can change the parameters of the material as we go. We actually make nonlinear structures and linearize them. We could make approximations to horns because we could have the stepped area changing as it went. We could have re-entrant horns, all that sort of stuff. We could have leaky structures. I did a bit of extension work on time of flight propagation that enabled us to look at summing in the far field. Combining that with these tools meant you could do a complete solution to an array. Yeah, and you could go into the array and design it. We came up with ways of acoustically equalising nasty boxes so that they sounded okay. Sort of thing that you've got in your mobile phone today. New approaches to anechoic chambers. We've always used shape wedges, surface absorption but we could have cascaded impedances that change as you go into them so the wave never reflects back. It just goes to the end and disappears into the concrete. We can make these multi-driver horn-throated things like Renkus Hines, they did the first ones, and Tom Danley's been doing a lot of work on this in the last decade or two. 
we could make stub equalizers, and I mentioned one of those in the 616. Cascaded structures, I mentioned those too. That is a powerful set of tools. But it also influences your thinking, because suddenly you're saying, I know this has to make sense. What structures make sense? What structures don't make stretch sense? Am I heading in the right direction? I'd like to say a few words about the loudspeaker drivers. Mike's here. Mike was um, instrumental in manufacturing a whole lot of new drivers for this. And I tell you, we wouldn't have been anywhere without him. He makes some amazingly good products. And we probably had a few challenges about distortion, didn't we, Mike? We... <laughs> but Mike rose to the challenge and he is just brilliant. He also published a paper which is worth having a look at because it summarises manufacturing techniques. And I've mentioned it too. Okay, so that's a very quick trip through the history of acoustics uh, and audio um, from 40,000 BC to now and showing along the way there was always a common thread, it was a wave. We've just got a bit smarter and a bit more trickier about how we manage it, but it's still just a wave. The picture there up the top shows one of those 616 boxes. It's sitting about there underneath the, the two choirs that we had. Did anybody go to that? That was at the Royal Exhibition Buildings. You're all too young. Mm. On, yeah. In Melbourne? In Melbourne, yeah. It's the, that was the exhibition buildings up in Carlton. You, you, you won't recognise it because we put all that in, but that's the back end window. It's a, it's a sort of a cross-shaped building. Very difficult. When was this? Uh, that was in 2000. It was a gift to the people of Australia for the bicentenary. You say you positioned the your face speakers under the seating. Yep. Didn't that make the people sitting there feel a bit ill? <laughs> <laughs> With the low frequencies and reduced. No, they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> they enjoyed it. Oh, okay. But the women enjoyed it or the men? <laughs> I'm a go man. They, they actually, they had two <laughs> organs. <laughs> this is a bit of a trick. So the, the low distortion was a very good idea. So, uh, but that was, it was a very large orchestra bigger than a normal orchestra, and very big choirs. Beautiful. I should have gone. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you understand what PAM is and where it fits with Neville now. Question. First of all, I want to thank Graham for putting a whole lot of mechanical stuff in the, in there. For yours truly, <laughs> finally someone who's actually put some mechanical into electronics. Um, had that been done when I was at university, I might even have changed fields and done <laughs> electronics, but I'm happy where I'm at at the moment. But Paolo, all it right. does is, is prove that you can resolve all mechanics into, <laughs> into electrical. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I won't accept that. The rest, the, group, the, the rest of the group, the rest of the group may not know that, that this gentleman here is the design guy for Anthenol. For their products around the world. Well, and and I'm, a, I'm a mechanical, well and truly mechanical, so I appreciate some insight <laughs> into the electronics and uh, the design of loud speakers and, and so forth. So uh, I think I think Graham's done a wonderful job of pulling all that together. So we just open it up with some questions. Yeah. So Why did we hear about this for the last 30 years? <laughs> I don't know. I, I promoted papers and conferences, and you know, me, I'll talk at the drop of a hat, and you don't even have to drop it. So it, it, it I don't know. To, to pick it up in the journal. A lot of a lot of companies either picked up what we did and then said we don't want to tell people how to do this. That was the first problem. And the second problem was if you went into solving some advanced maths, there was usually somebody in the company who still believed there was an ideal box design, and that you, I, I had that issue. Mm -hmm. I probably can't talk about it now, but I had that issue in Japan where I tried to make the research guys at Alpine own this and take it on. And they rejected it because it wasn't what they'd been doing. It was very difficult. But anyway, so I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it has a renaissance. I don't know. Neville's, stuff, Neville's stuff was 
10 years before anybody even knew it, and 20 years before it even got out there, like 58, 1958 was his first paper. So this is just about right. <laughs> um, you want to handle it? Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Can I take you to the slide of your equivalent circuit with um, all the impedances and. Yep. That one. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so you model the tube, which is normally an acoustic mass, as a, as a, uh, as a transmission line. Yep. Understand that? What are the inductances doing there? Yes, are they, we, are they when masses? Are they uh, no, they're, 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 what are, are they physically inductors? They're a velocity dependent impedance, and the reason for those, I probably should have left them out, but they're in the patent, so you'll see them in there. What happens is when you come to a step, the gas itself can't instantaneously adopt the velocity of the new tube. So, so they're, they're end corrections? They are. Good pick up. Good. Questions. I recall in Berenick and I think some early work by Benson and I looked at when I was studying that they had this whole concept of the three levels and energy transfer from Yes, they did. Another. And they had two types of mobility models. Yeah, yeah they had the author on. They didn't have transmission lines in them and that's where they probably differed very much. Yeah, I, yeah. The, what we were doing was just putting a whole lot of bits together. If we didn't have the spice that. solver, the spice solver just inverts a huge matrix and gives you the answers for it. If we hadn't had the spice solver, we would have had an issue. We had to have transmission lines because we knew it was a distributed problem. And we had to choose one of the various models that you could use for going between the various domains. The introduction Olsen, of Olsen had done it. The introduction of transmission lines throughout this, including the stub matching, all of those sorts of things, which is common in uh, antenna work yeah, and yeah. Sort of stuff. That wasn't brought up in the courses that I did back in the 70s. Yeah. Why? Why not? I mean, to me, it well, was they, obvious. They were still working with Berenick and, and um, okay, the other yeah. papers. But those guys, those guys right. knew this. Right? Berenick particularly, brilliant bloke. Mm. Olsen knew it. They knew it. I'm sure there'd be a hundred Russians. The there. people who taught me did. That's yes, the problem. Okay. It, was, it was missing out of the education system okay. at a time when it probably should be. Um, do you want to? Great. Yeah. Great. Ross just uh, alluded to something which, which I would have just left notice for watching this. Um, I'd probably do more on on um, trying to model and resolve antenna systems than I do audio these days. But suddenly see the parallels just yeah. massively. Yeah, where, where, when you. When you Making stuff, I thought, yeah, well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that, that, all, all that, that methodology has been around in the antenna systems for the yeah. part of half a century. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why not do it? Well, put some idiot to do it, did it? <laughs> Very true. And, and stub matching, I mean, I did a lot of work on reactive stubs. I've done more work since this. Gone on to diffractive models, all sorts of things. but. All of that work on reactive equalization, absolutely analogous. You've got two vectors, B and H, versus one scalar and one vector, but otherwise it's exactly the same. And when you mentioned, you know, that, that speaker design mm. that you showed earlier had no, no loss of components in it. No. Mm. Who, who when they're trying to match a, match a line between that 10 of two resistors? <laughs> <laughs> what, what do I say? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, no, don't bother. Has uh, eight resistors in it? Yeah, you can. You can. You can get round the Smith chart and duck it in. Yeah. You keep you keep moving it away from the sound source. No, no. <laughs> He's the sound police. Yeah. The question. Sound police. Now, in in the lumped model. Yes. We've got. We've got um, port losses. We've got box losses. Yes. All absorption things. We've yes. got viscous losses. Yes. Tiny tubes have got viscous losses. Yes. So we've got were the viscous losses in the model. In the model, we for the velocity losses, we started out by using lossy transmission line models from Spice, and they 
just don't work for this stuff. So what we ended up doing was combinations of inductances and resistances, and they can get very um, complicated because it's a frequency dependent loss uh, and it's dispersive, so they become very complex. In the end, we would model by having the lossless model, then we would make corrections for overall loss on the transfer function more so than trying to include all those values in the transmission lines. But that's not a theoretical approach, that's just a practical approach to that. If you look at Dick Small's work, which is Bob on Neville Teal's work, mm. because Dick said to me, I added box loss and port loss to Dick's work, to, to Neville's work. Yes, yes. And, but that was, in, that was intrinsic to the mathematics. Yes. So yes. you're saying you're doing heuristic correction effectively. Basically yeah. we were, we were, yeah, yeah. But when you went further, you could solve those equations and where I scurried back to in the end was Helmholtz and going through the equations again and I've just been annoying this bloke because I've got to go back into the very close field, the evanescent region, to solve that. And at and it, it, this time, that was too complex <laughs> for us. Please help us. <laughs> Not sure I can. <laughs> Is there a relationship from all this is how they're able to do exhaust systems on petrol engine and diesel engines. Yes. They've got yeah. the exhaust systems fantastic. Yes, they have. And they're this, they they're this, yeah. have to experiment beforehand. Yeah, there's a big issue with exhaust systems. We, I, who was saying it? Um, you were, yeah, it was you. Discussion with me. We did design work on induction charging of internal combustion engines using this technology. The exhaust systems were much harder because there's huge temperature gradients in exhaust systems. So it's a much more complex model. But we did the induction side and we got some very, very, very good results out of that. Even up to the point that you're bordering on sonic flow. It's quite amazing how well behaved gas is. But that was, we needed more solutions to the equations. A plug of gas, when it's being smashed along a tube, at high velocity, like in an induction system, shears off all of the edge, the momentum shears off from the boundary and it behaves like a plug on ball bearings. It's a very complex um, sort of thing. So exhaust systems, we could do a bit of work on that but it was hard. Induction systems, we did some very good and effective work. And we could add turbochargers, it's just a motor and superchargers and then we I did come up with a burn model which I was I think I was talking to you about the burn model wasn't it? Anyway I came up with a burn model which is just a catalyzed chemical reaction that predicted onset of detonation and could work with all the different fuel types and all that sort of stuff. The next thing is we got our gas coming out of um, Bastrade comes up thing. Yes. Then we used to have to have big cylinders up like a Danny on build it all up so that when the gas industry would start in the morning, we'd go down, we don't need it anymore. And it's all to do with the flow in the pipes. So we've got the pipe there and that. Is that, is, is that the relationship with this as well? It is. I, I've got a bit of peripheral knowledge on that. The, the problem with the pipelines is that there's a lot of paraffins in the gas and they give you arterial sclerosis in your pipes basically so all the pipes had to be heated and they had a lot of trouble with that and I think what they've done is resolve that issue so they don't have build up of, of insolubles but I don't know it's not my field. Right because then there was fields in South Australia north of the Venus Ranges and the pipe went to Sydney and then somebody doing some work here realised if you're not careful you'll have a standing wave and oh yes, 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 pipe. yes, yes, yes. Then the pipe burst. Yes, now, I had yes. a friend here in Melbourne. Yes. It didn't catch fire, so no, it's all catch, hush, hush. He took me in an aeroplane and took me up there and flew along it before he came there and I saw where the standing waves had collided. Yeah. The pipe, yeah. Well, I'm talking more yeah, than but this, 
the, the, the way it's ripped out of the ground yeah. and burst and come back and saw all that. Absolutely. I, the, the, the electrical guys will tell you in aerial theory you can get flash <laughs> overs and all sorts of things. I will tell you you can get huge overpressures. You solve that whole thing as a network. Instability in power networks, 50 hertz power networks. If you stretch the network across the USA, you get time delay, you get phase inversions, the networks can go unstable. And they did. That's why New somewhere went off. New York, I think, went off the air. Sure. Instability in the grid, till they knew. And they, they said the easiest way to do this is pull out somewhere and put a DC link in. Because <laughs> we can't handle these waves. But this enabled that. And it's, that, that wasn't new. They enabled that to be done. So. And that's not happening in South Australia too, to extent. Yeah, we've got a national grid now. Interesting yeah, concept. It doesn't work out. No. South Australia, we're not transmission line. Yeah. 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 I was wondering, so let's say you, you put it all, you have a speaker, you're modeling, you get your mathematical model, you've got the coefficients in there. Mm. They want to calculate how do you get the coefficients? I can imagine for a speaker box, you can go back to first principles and so on. But for a car that has so many different materials mixed together in highly non-linear non -linear geometry, how do you get to the coefficients to actually calculate? Well, I, I wouldn't say this was the only modelling tool used to the engines. The engine, the fundamental engine issue is first, everybody was modelling it. When we started doing it, everybody was modelling it as a gas flow problem. Mm -hmm. And they were doing streamlining and so on. And I said, well, wait a minute, every time the engine turns once, the end of that is completely blocked. So what's the point of doing streamlining? It's an acoustic power reflection model. So all I need to do is to put switch circuit elements into this and I've got the, the, start, the basic start of a model. Then we do lots of other things. But then still you, you want to calculate, so you've got a lot of coefficients in there that you need to determine out experimentally or how do you actually... How did you design a structure is that the question? No. I imagine that the mathematical mo model has some dependence on time, but it also has certain coefficients, like your ohms, for example, or um, yes. area, yes. pressure, etc. Well, it wasn't as simple as this. What we were doing was saying, well, we've got changes in temperature and therefore it's affecting the propagation velocity, but all of those were governed by what you put in, how much food, fuel you spray in. Um, maybe corrections on thermal conductivity, big issues with surface roughness and momentum transfer models, not well understood. You know, a bit of orthogonal momentum comes into the gas flow and it trips unstable flow. Mm -hmm. So those had to be included. Um, mechanics of a, an engine is just a mechanical device that has things moving and things changing and pressures going up and down. You can do all that, that's easy. But you still need to have some model that predicts what the evaporating fuel is going to do and interesting things came out of that about how to suppress detonation which still haven't been used actually yeah I'm, I'm digressing out of questions it's not really audio engineering is it what it does show though is the um, convergence of all mm. the fields of engineering into yeah. one solid yeah. theory yeah. 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 that's very important yeah. electrical rules <laughs> We've got a camp here, <laughs> but I, I've been trying to tell you that acoustic rules. You know. Well, thank you. absolutely, and I think um, when you started talking about gas in tubes, is when I finally understood why you were so excited about my undergraduate thesis. Oh, now you do. <laughs> now the pennies drop. You know, I, I did a undergraduate thesis for my engineering degree with uh, gas dynamics and uh, a polyurethane foam, so we're talking supersonic waves and the like, and, um, we just happened to be talking about it over a coffee and all of a sudden Graham got particularly excited <laughs> and um, so there's, there's more discussions to be had there and I'm, I'm pleased that my thesis I'm is... I'm hoping that's the thesis. So, more coffee. So, uh, <laughs> that's and, not and, the thesis. And, 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 and as a word of, uh, and as a gesture of, uh, of thanks, Graham, and I know you humbly <laughs> all, uh, instructed us not to do it for you, but I think it's entirely deserved. Uh, I think everyone here would agree. Uh, here, here. Wonderful presentation, fascinating topic, and mm -hmm. thank you very much for your time and yeah. effort in putting it together. Oh, no problem, it. no problem. Um, all the best, mate. Well done. Yeah.
I can model that shape and see how quickly I can empty it. That's pretty cute. Thanks very much. That's good.